before you this evening, thanking you for another opportunity to be in your house, Lord, and to take a look at your word. I pray, Father, you will be with us tonight in a special way, Father, speaking to our hearts and speaking through me that your name might be glorified. I pray, Father, you'd be with the teens and the young people in the back and help them to learn, Father, and that the seed planted would remain and bear fruit in their lives, Father, not just for a little time now, but for their whole life, Father. May they learn things that would transform them, uh, would help them, uh, would protect them uh, from uh, the evils of this world as they grow older. And so, Father, we thank you again for who you are and, and what you're going to do. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. All right. Okay, so we'll continue on our study in Second uh, Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I wasn't able to be here last week, so it's almost like starting over again in Second Thessalonians. All right, chapter 1. Now, like I said, the last time we looked at Second Thessalonians, it was written in response to Paul's letter of First Thessalonians, uh, where uh, they had some questions. They were going through hardships, severe hardship, through severe persecution at Thessalonica. And, uh, and they had gotten wrong information. Somebody had written a letter in Paul's name and had given them false information. And so Paul has to clarify all that. And uh, so that's part of the reason why he's writing Second Thessalonians. So he starts in this first cha chapter by giving them uh, some encouragement, the encouragement of praise. He praised them for a number of things. He praised them because their faith was growing. Uh, in verse 3, it says at the bottom part of verse 3, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. So he's praising them because their faith was growing. Um, their love was abounding, right after he says that, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounded. So their love was growing, their love was abounding, uh, their patience was increasing, verse number four, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all, the, in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. And so he was praising them because of uh, their patience was increasing as they were enduring these persecutions and tribulations. And then uh, verse number four also, the fourth thing, their testimony was helping others. So how was their testimony helping others? Well, the first part of verse four says, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God. And that just simply means that as Paul was going to the other churches that were established and visiting them, uh, he, was, he was praising the Thessalonians. He was telling them what they were enduring, and that was causing other people to take courage in what they were facing, and they were uh, taking heart. And that's why it's good to uh, you know, read books and stuff that come from like a, um, a Voice of the Martyrs. I get an email from them. And so you always kind of kept abreast of the different things that are happening around the world. And uh, there's different books that they have published from different spots of the world where Christians are, are facing persecution. Some areas you wouldn't even think there would be persecution there, but there is. And uh, the encouragement is, man, you realize how good you have it here. Amen and how what we're doing. We take for granted being able to do this, uh, whereas a lot of people, they just, they, you know, they take a chance anytime they get together uh, because it's illegal, and there's people that want to stop them. Sometimes it's not even the government. It is just other religious groups. Uh, sometimes it's uh, the cartel, the drug industry, because just like when Paul would go through the book of Acts and he would preach in different areas and people would get saved and then they stopped selling the idols that the people were buying. The people were buying these idols and, and had these shrines in their homes and praying to these idols. These idols were like good luck charms. Well, once they got saved, they didn't need the idols no more. So the business went down 
And the people that sold them, the silversmiths, they started persecuting Paul. Well, the same thing is happening with the drug cartels. When people are getting saved, and uh, the Christians end up being a hindrance to their business. And so they want to stop them. They don't want, and sometimes they stop them before anything happens because they don't want you preaching the gospel and, and messing with their business. Uh, not only with getting customers, but having workers, people to run their drugs for them. And so that has happened too, more so in Central and South America uh, where you have that happening. But, uh, but persecution uh, is something that we, the, the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ has had to deal with since its inception. And it will until Jesus comes back. We have only been fortunate enough to be born in America in a free country, amen? And uh, the First Amendment, freedom of religion, the reason they put that there was because everybody that came here was trying to escape persecution. You know, they were getting persecuted in all these other lands. And so the pilgrims came over and, and they wanted to spread the gospel in this new land, but they also wanted to be free from the heavy hand of not only Catholicism, but some of the other uh, denominations like the Lutherans and Presbyterian. And John Calvin was notorious for killing anybody that disagreed with him. So we would be dead simply because we believed in baptism uh, by sa after salvation by immersion. That was enough for John Calvin to kill you. So anybody out there listening to me, you're all Calvinists and John Calvin heroes. Your hero was a murderer. So anybody that's going to tell you, I'm going to tell you. Amen? He was a murderer. Check me out. Check my history on it. You'll find out what I'm telling you is true. And uh, have no, no love for, for that, that movement. Amen? But, uh, but anyway, I'm getting in the flesh right now because persecution does that. I was reading Fox's Book of Martyrs, and I started getting mad. And he's talking about the history of, of Christians that had been persecuted uh, through the Roman Empire and beyond that. And it's just a sad, sad thing to see what Christians had endured. Some people were thrown in a, uh, a uh, if you can picture a big bull that was supposed to be the god Baal, and they would throw them in there, and then they would roast them to death. Now think about how that thing starts heating up. Where are you going to put your hands? Whatever it touches is burning. And you'd be in there just burning up. Just unbelievable, the different torturous things that they would do. And um, Fast forward in the history, the, the, we're called Anabaptists because we were against infant baptism. Well, uh, the penalty for Anabaptists was, guess what? You got drowned. You want to baptize? You want to go on immersion? Then they dip you in the water, bring you up, dip you, bring you up, and then finally they just let you down, and, and that was it. In one case, they, they chained a bunch of Christians together and sent them over this cliff so that the weight of the one before them would pull them over. And a whole bunch of them fell off a cliff to their death. It's just amazing the, the horrific stuff that has happened. And there's been more Christians martyred for their faith in the last hundred years than all the time before that, totaled together. And a lot of it has come through communism, communist persecution. China is very, very bad. Um, Russia is very bad. All those communist nations. And uh, it's sad. In fact, you know, our critics try to say, well, you Christians killed more people than anybody else. No, we didn't. First of all, it was the Roman Catholics that were doing it. And secondly, if you check your facts, you're going to find out that the communists have killed far more people than we ever killed in the uh, Crusades. And I shouldn't say we, because Bible believers weren't part of the Crusades, amen? So, uh, and that was really technically to give a little bit of slack to the Catholics. I don't like to do that too much. But to give them a little bit of slack, it was technically a war be between uh, the countries of Islam that were advancing in the second jihad. And so there was a response to that, to push them back and ultimately try to regain Jerusalem. But, uh, but, and they did, and then they lost it again, and then, you know, history has the, the volley back and forth. But, uh, but it's, it's been sad that all the death and destruction and killing that's happened. 
I thank God that someday Jesus is going to come back and there'll be no more of that. Amen? There'll be no more of that. So, so here's this, they, they endured their persecution and Paul talked about, you know, their faith and what they endured to other Christians so that they would also be encouraged. Now, what else was there? There was the encouragement of praise, but there was also the encouragement of promise that God was going to be with them through the, the, the things that they suffered, that it would actually be a source of reward. We're going to look at some other verses, but first let's look at verse number 5 through 10. Is all under the second point here, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Now, he's not talking about a work salvation and being worthy there, but, but uh, showing their worthiness through what they were suffering. Uh, showing the, a manifest token meant, meant a sign or an evidence that God was working, that it was a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. Let's look at a few verses. Uh, that Well, first of all, let's look at, to get that manifest token, to get a better understanding of what that means, let's look at when it's used over in Philippians 1.28. Philippians 1, we have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Now, the way to remember that is two ways. The spiritual way is go evangelize people continually. That's the spiritual way. If you're not that spiritual, then you m memorize it, go eat popcorn. <laughs> so whatever works for you, but that's how you memorize those, those books, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Philippians chapter 1, verse uh, 28, it says, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. And there's that word, the evident token. And other, uh, in Thessalonians, he says a manifest token. Here's an evident token of what? Of perdition. It's showing their failure, their, their hostility to the gospel, but it's showing your belief in the gospel, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation that, and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. See, the people at, in, in Philippi were suffering also, were suffering persecution. And of course, Thessalonica is not far from Philippi. But I want you to notice something, because as Americans, when we get persecuted, it's a woe's me attitude, isn't it? You know, oh, they're picking on me, they're picking on Christians. But notice what he says, for unto you it is given. This is a gift from God. It is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. See that? Sometimes God's will is that we suffer. Peter says the same thing, if needs be, your manifold temptation, if needs be. And so we might have to do that. Verse 30 says, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Having the same conflict which you saw in me. They saw the same persecution that Paul was going through, and he endured it. Now they're going through it, and they'll endure it. And it may be soon, I don't want to suffer persecution. <laughs> I'd be crazy to say I did. But it may come here soon. It, it's all around us. It's, it's creeping in. And even the way laws are being tailored, uh, you know, we could be in a lot of hot water real soon. Um, let's look at a couple of verses that talk about the reward of enduring persecution. First of all, look at Matthew, where Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. That's part of what? The Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew chapter 5. And uh, let me see here. Verse, verses 10 through 12. Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now notice, Blessed, which means to be happy. Blessed are they 
which are persecuted for righteousness sake. Not because you're being an idiot, but because of righteousness. Sometimes Christians bring stuff upon themselves and say, oh, I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian. Nah, you're being persecuted because you're acting like an idiot, you know? I've seen Christians do that before. Uh, verse number 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So people aren't, aren't just going to bodily harm you, but they're going to use their lips, their words, to defame your character. They're going to speak lies. They're going to say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So you're standing for me, and now they're making up rumors about you. And anytime you get a move of God going, you know, expect that stuff like that is going to happen. It, it happened in all major revival mo uh, movements uh, where the men of God that were used were ridiculed greatly. I mean, today we talk about uh, John Wesley and George Whitfield and John, John Edwards. Am I saying that right? John Edwards. Uh, all as being heroes of the faith, even uh, Spurgeon. We, we speak of these guys as heroes of the faith. Well, if we were living in the day in which they were living, they were all attacked viciously with rumors and th saying things about them that wasn't true. And Jesus said that this was going to happen. Back in the Sermon on the Mount, he said that this would happen. Now, he said this is our attitude. The attitude that we have when this happens is get, get all our sticks and clubs together, load our weapons. That's not what he says. He says rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why in the world do I want to rejoice and be exceeding glad when I'm being persecuted? For great is your reward in heaven. So it's not just little is your reward in heaven, but great is your reward in heaven. I don't know what that entails, but Jesus said it was great. And when you think about how great creation is, how great everything God does, how fantastic it is, if he says that it's a great reward, and amen, it's, it's beyond what you could ever, you know, you know, imagine. So he says, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So you're not the only one to get per persecuted. He did it to the prophets. All of them were persecuted, every one of them. And, uh, and, it, and it will happen. But, uh, but don't get upset, rejoice, and be exceeding glad. Now, when you don't do something because you're afraid of persecution you miss out on a reward, right? So say, you know, Glenn's a lost guy. I don't know who he is. And I get this thought, you know, I should, just, I should give him a track, amen? And I don't because I'm afraid that, well, you know, he might not take it too well. He might get upset. And then you don't give him a track. First of all, I let, I'm letting this guy die and go to hell because I'm afraid of how he's going to react. Secondly, I'm not giving it to him because I'm afraid of the persecution than Christians that are truly saved. It's absolutely, it floors my mind to think about that. But, uh, but there's a great reward. There's a promise of reward. And it's a, an encouragement to heart, or of heart. And then uh, uh, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. I kind of quoted some of that to you earlier. 1 Peter chapter 3. No, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. 1 Peter Chapter 1 and verses 3 through 9, there the word of God says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and it fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, and in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, 
receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. But enduring that, if you might have to be enduring some trials, some uh, temptations, manifold temptations. Manifold means multidimensional. And I said this to you in the past. It, it seems like when you get one thing, you get a ton of things, right? It just, it just like the whole thing is caving in on you. Well, God knows what you need, and, and he's there with us, amen? And sometimes it's that way with persecution. So back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So the encouragement of promise, and uh, three experiences are involved in the promise of God for his people. There's a reward. We looked at those verses. There's a promise of reward, but there's also a promise of recompense. Recompense means to pay back. Now, that isn't for us to do. That's for God to do. And when we let God do it, it is far more effective. Amen? So let's look at verse number 6 here. It's uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Recompense once again. God is going to pay back tribulation to them that trouble you. So whoever's dishing out, the persecution, guess what? They've got a good dose coming back at them. God will take care of it, amen? And, uh, and it could be pretty, pretty bad. It could be pretty severe. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now he's talking about rest, your you're in these tribulations. Don't let it get you all in a bunch. Don't get all excited. Rest with us because this is what's going to happen. When Jesus comes back, now he's talking about the literal second coming of Christ here. So when Jesus comes back, Revelation chapter 19, to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So he's coming back with an army. And it's his mighty angels. Now for some reason, Christians got this crazy idea that that they're going to come back and they're going to fight with Jesus. No, Jesus doesn't need our help. And besides that, he's got the mighty angels with him. Amen? And so he's coming back with this escort with his mighty angels in flaming fire. I mean, think about the picture that Paul is painting here. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. That know not God. And this isn't talking about you know, knowing about God, but knowing God intimately, knowing him personally. They know not God. They do not know him as their Lord and their Savior. And, and they refuse to believe. And so now there is this flame and fiery judgment. Taking vengeance is not revenge, but it's just reward for crimes committed. You've got to understand that. God's not coming back for revenge. And we're not to seek revenge, but it's vengeance. It's, it's, it's a righteous judgment of God on these people and what they have done and what they are doing. And flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They don't obey the gospel. They don't believe the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection. Now, you know, I hate to, 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 to say this, but to put it in its context, I guess you don't really know the heart of any individual but judging by the actions, this is not going to pan well for people like Joe Biden, right? For, for people like Nancy Pelosi, uh, for people like Mitch McConnell. I mean, come on now. These people got a lot to answer for, amen? Their decisions affect the whole nation, and their unrighteousness is affecting the whole nation. But it's good. they're going to pay unless they get saved and obey the gospel. They're going to pay. There's going to be a flaming, fiery vengeance. And, and if this doesn't happen to them at the second coming of Jesus Christ, it'll happen if they die. I want you to think, if Joe Biden dies tonight, if he were to die tonight, he would slip into an eternal hell where he'd be in, in eternal torments and flame and fire paying for his sin, which the penalty, the price tag on that is eternal. Amen? It is eternal. And we need to let that sink in because a lot of times we're wishing bad on people and we've got to realize, listen, they're going to get their just reward. 
But you need to understand how severe that just reward is going to be. So it shouldn't make us happy that, oh, yeah, he's going to fry. Praise God. It should break our hearts knowing that, no, this dude is going to fry forever. Lost. Lost with no hope. Lost. Amen? Absolutely incredible. How many politicians, how many judges, how many just friends and relatives and neighbors lost with no hope and a fiery judgment as soon as they closed their eyes. Jesus told us that the rich man lifted up his eyes, being tormented in this flame. He lifted up his eyes. Boom, he's in hell. He opens his eyes. Wow. And it's not going to end. It's not going to end. I heard a guy the other day, he, he, he asked, he said, do you believe that, that hell, this was on television, he said, do you believe that hell is forever uh, eternal flame or just until you, you get used to it? I'm thinking, get used to it? And the guy he was talking to said, no, you don't ever get used to it. It's eternal fire, never, never ending. Absolutely incredible. And... Uh, and, the, and this other person, their response well, is, well, hell is all around us. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. I don't see the building on fire. I don't see anybody here engulfed in flame. I don't see anybody here being tormented. No. This hell is not around you. What is around you is the manifestation of the sin nature of man, the manifestation of the curse that, that man brought not only on himself but on the whole creation. Amen? The whole creation. And uh, hell is a real place. And so here Jesus, or not Jesus, but Paul says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that, that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Everlasting destruction. See, every human soul was created Every human person is created with a soul and a spirit that is eternal. Amen? This body may grow old and go to dust, but the you inside you is eternal. You are created in the image of God. You are indestructible. Therefore, wherever you find yourself, there you'll be forever. So everlasting destruction, it's not to a point that it ends, but it's always it's a, constant, a constant destruction and ruin upon the soul and the spirit of those individuals who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Now think about that. You're not only in a place of torment, place of fiery indignation, but you're in a place where God's presence can never be felt. You're separated from God eternally. Wow. Think about that. Eternally. Right now, no matter what happens, God is a prayer away. The Lord is with us, amen? The Lord is living in believers, but even for a lost person, the Lord is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. But once you die and slip into hell, that's it. You're, you're separated from his presence. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. From the glory of his power, meaning there's absolutely no hope to be delivered from that. No hope. There's some weirdo, I heard him on Christian radio about a year or two years ago, and it, what he said was so stupid it stayed with me. He wrote a book, too. I mean, I imagine he sold a lot of books. He said that you went to hell until you finally had enough and called upon the Lord, and then you were saved. He said some people it might take longer than others. A Hitler, it might take 2,000 years before he calls on the Lord. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. If that, if, first of all, if that was a possibility, I think you would be calling on the Lord as soon as you were there. Amen? Not waiting 2,000 years. But this is the ridiculous society that we live in, and people write books and they make money, and stupid people buy books and believe them. I mean, instead of just buying the book, you can still get a copy of the Bible even at Walmart. Amen? You can still get a copy of the Bible almost anywhere. So don't read these stupid books by people. And especially don't read the Watchtower magazine. Amen? That's garbage too. But, uh, but anyway, uh, verse number 10 says, When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. 
So when Jesus comes back, he's going to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Think about that. Admired by all them that believe. See, right now, Jesus isn't really admired for who he is. Oh, the, the false Jesus of the world, he's admired because he just wouldn't hurt anybody. He's about all love and tolerance. and That's not the Jesus of the Bible, amen? The Jesus of the Bible had some hard things to say. And, uh, and he wasn't a pushover like they make him out to be. Well, when Jesus comes back with his saints, he is going to be admired in all them that believe. So all the believers will be here when Jesus comes back. Well, when he comes, we'll be coming back with him. But those that have made it through the tribulation that had faith in Jesus Christ, uh, there'll be this time of rejoicing and Jesus will be here and everybody that believed will be admiring him, worshiping him, adoring him. Amen. It's already happening in heaven, but it's not happening on earth, but someday it will happen around this planet. Why is that? Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Because our testimony among you was believed. So why do the Thessalonians have this great hope? Because they believe what Paul preached. They believe the gospel message. Amen. And, you know, scholars scoff at it. They make fun of it. And uh, yesterday, I just, I wasted too much time yesterday. I was on my Kindle watching these things about the first century Christians and the early Christians and they had all these liberals, all these liberals from Duke University and all these other universities. And I'm like, this is the saddest thing I ever heard. Here are these people. Man, they know the Bible. They know the New Testament inside and out. But they don't believe it. They don't believe it. One, one woman even said about the, uh, the myths of the miracles of the New Testament. I said, they're not myths. I mean, you're, you're teaching this religious course at this college. It's not a myth. It's real. Amen. It really happened. And they have all this knowledge and not believe it. And there's that, that one guy that uh, I heard him say in, in other programs on the History Channel and stuff, and he's a professor of religion, and he said, he said, well, the, you know, the, the resurrection, I, could, I can uh, take it or leave it. It doesn't matter to me. No, you can't take it or leave it. If he didn't rise again, then you're not saved. Amen? You've you got to believe the whole thing, death, burial, and resurrection. And, and this guy was like, he was like, well, the Gospels were meant to, uh, for us to just draw lessons from, not to take literally. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Then if you're going to play that game, then anything can mean anything, right? Then it's, the doors are blown open for whatever you want to believe. No, you take it literally. That's why they use real words, real literal words with literal sentences, with literal meanings for us to read and understand. Not to sit here and guess and wonder, well, I wonder what flame and, pit and flame and fire take in vengeance on them? Wow, what does that mean? Hmm, let's think of, come on, you know what it means. Exactly what it says. I remember that, you know, in Bible college and I'm working security and I was witnessing the guy working at the front desk. His name was Art. And, uh, and Art was, was saying, I, I said, listen, Art, you're making this more difficult than it is. The Bible says, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Now, what does that mean? For all have sinned. For all have sinned. For all have sinned. I said, for crying out loud, Art. <laughs> you ever seen those moments where Jackie Gleason gets frustrated with Norm and he yells? That was a Jackie Gleason moment for me. For crying out loud, Art. What do you, for all have sinned. That means all of us sinned. You know? And he's playing. And he's like, well, why Abraham? Why did God choose Abraham? I said, I don't know, and it doesn't matter. The fact is, he did. That's all that matters. Now, you have to deal with the ramifications of that, not sit here and figure it out, die and go to hell trying to figure out all these things that don't matter. Just believe what it says. But yet, there's so many people, they think when they approach the Bible that somehow it's this, this mystical understanding. It's not a mystical understanding. It is very simple. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For whosoever shall call God saving upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What is so hard and difficult about that? 
The only thing that gets in the way is, is my pride because I don't want to humble myself before God. And so it's not that hard to understand. He said, because our testimony among you was believed. That's why you have this hope. As you endure this persecution, you have this hope. Now, he encouraged them, the encouragement of praise, praising for what they were doing right and was growing, the encouragement of promise. They had some promise that God would take care of those that were persecuting them, and, and they had a great hope ahead of them. And then also in the encouragement of prayer. The encouragement of prayer. Verse 11 says, Wherefore also we pray always for you. There was the encouragement of prayer. They had the encouragement that regardless of what they were facing, the Apostle Paul was praying for them. Always. He says, Wherefore we also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. And that's absolutely incredible. This is what he's praying for them for. Count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. And, and we all have this walk and this work of faith and we all have a calling on our life. We all have that which God wants us to do and we need to be praying that, that we would manifest that. That Verse 12 is also praying for them that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him. Think about the intimate fellowship he's talking about in that prayer. He's praying for them that the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in you, but not just that, and ye in him. See that? In you, and he in him. This is that, that fellowship that we have with Jesus Christ. He's praying that that would become more real to them, uh, more functional in their life, that you may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace, the unmerited favor of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is his prayer. This is, he's praying for them like Sunday night's message, moving into the Holy of Holies, amen? The Holy of Holies experience of being with God, knowing Him. You just know it. You feel His presence with you, amen? You feel it, and you know it. You just know that He's there at that moment, amen? All right, any thoughts or questions on any of that? Okay, so next week we get into chapter 2, and then we'll be getting into some tough stuff in there uh, about the, uh, the uh, second coming. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the holy word of God, and just pray, Lord, that you would use your word for your glory and honor, that it would bear fruit in life. I pray if anybody heard this message, God, that doesn't know you, Father, that they would put their faith and trust in you. Only a prayer away. Only believing in you, Lord. Just simple trust that what you have done on the cross was enough to pay the penalty for all their sin, past, present, and future. And just put their hope in you. Oh, God, please save souls even now as your word would go out and go forth. Thank you again, Father, for this time together. And now may you be glorified and honored in taking up these requests and praying over them. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. All right, Jeremy, if you want to come and uh, take, up, uh, take up our prayer request. And, uh... <coughs>